Well, what a blessing to have a third opportunity to spend some more time with you, Michael. I'm so grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Um, so where I wanted to go today was to talk about, um, I guess, preparing for one's end of life. And I mean, I, as a doula, um, I help people make their plans and do advanced care directives and talk about what funeral options there are and what sort of urns you can use and all of that sort of stuff. Then, of course, there's the more medical side of that and um, substitute decision makers and all of the paperwork and things. Um, but I, I'd i like to sort of, uh, you know, advanced care planning week is coming up and I I know as a, as a doctor, you will have obviously had a lot of experience around planning and people's plans. So I'd love you to speak to just anything that you want to share about advanced care planning in your experience, both if you like professionally, but like what about your own? Like, you know, have, is that something, because I've, I've got to do my own planning, which I have done, but I'd like to talk about our approach to it as well. It's interesting that... Um... My experience of working with people as they make their own advanced care directive is limited mm -hmm. for the simple reason. When I was in private practice, there was no such thing as advanced right. care directive. Right. And then when I got into palliative care, um, they had either done it or just didn't want to do it. In other words, by the time they saw us, probably an advanced care plan, as you've described, or something that you know, comes close to an advanced care plan has been um, determined. So my my work in palliative care, and I think this would be true of anyone, is just um, um, sort of keeping them on that path because there's so much that can take them away from that. And more often than that, that's overwhelming fear, anxiety and all those things because the best laid plans of mice and men come yes. apart very quickly, you know, if something is not going as you imagine. Yes. So it's a bit like, um, you know, you were talking of sharing that experience of um, that person who seemed to be restless and you were wondering what you could do. But it's witnessing and being there that's allowing people to go through. So with certainly my connection to people who had a life-limiting illness who we're going through a tough time, <clears throat> whether it was something from past experience or the fear of what was going to happen to them, just sit down and try and let them talk about it. Yes. It's, it's allowing them to explore. That's just, I say my role is just to be there and listen and not mm. make any assessment, judgments or mm. whatever, just to listen and, and reflect um, as best I can. Yes. Yeah. what they've said and what they may be feeling mm. um, so, and it's not easy work but the thing i keep having to remind myself if they're talking to you about it you're the one they want to talk to certainly at this moment so to believe them mm. it's going to do them untold harm yes. so forget about your sense my sense of inadequacy how I'm uncomfortable about whatever it is. Just be totally present to what they're saying. Deal with your own issues once you're out of the room. That yes. type of thing. Right. Yes. Um, so I suppose my experience is limited. I have, however, and Eden and I have both uh, completed our advanced care directive and we're virtually at the stage of updating it because you know as well as I it's it needs to be current to yes. ensure as best you can that it's going to be accepted and respected by the care and team. Um, but it doesn't stop there. You know, no. you don't once it's done, you don't just put it somewhere or hand it over to the doctor or it goes onto your health record. Um, it's communicating your wishes with next of kin. Yes. And having deep conversations about that because my experience with um, certainly our family is they hear it, but once they've heard it, okay, let's move on. Right. So we need to hear yes. how you feel about this. Yes. How would you feel if we are in bed dying and the doctor comes up to you and says, look, 
it's time we think it's time to turn the respirator off. You know what we've said. Yes. How are you going to deal with it? Yes. Um, and that's an ongoing conversation. Now Christmas dinner start with a review. Right. <laughs> now that we're both in our eighties, about if in the event of us right. become seriously ill, this is what we want. Yes. And what we want is influenced by what life means to us, what do we value in life, and if we can no longer engage in these activities, and not just physical ones, but just being able to converse and to be independent, Yes. then our choices will perhaps change to one yes. about letting us die. Yes. You know, I, I, I think that's just so important. It, 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 to me, the crux of it is those conversations and and something that we actively encourage. And one of the, I think, the the big skill sets or the, or the great things in a doula's toolkit is the capacity to ask questions and then zip it and listen, not to give advice and to fix. I've had to sack Mrs. Fix-It. Um, and uh, but but to listen and hear and as you say reflect back to people because it is and and uh, there's someone I worked with recently who said will you please talk to me about the, the impending death of my son and he's only young um, but he has a terminal illness and I said of course I will and and she said because everyone else tells me to focus on the positive and be positive she said he's going to die I need a plan. I need to talk about it. I need to know what I'm going to do because otherwise I think I'm going to fall apart. Yeah. And so we created this plan and, you know, and I said, well, what about you ask him? He's five. He's got opinions. Why don't you ask him? Because he's yeah. really clear cool, young fellow and just so on the ball. And um, and so, and she did. And and his words were, no more hospital, mummy. No more yeah. hospital. Because yeah. he's had a lot of history of his life in hospital. Yeah. And so it's just talking to them and then her sharing that with her family and and knowing that she's got, you know, a, a doula behind her to go, we'll support you, you know, in, in what you need at the time. And I just think it's so critical to have those conversations as hard and confronting as they can be, you know, because, you know, we don't want to face it sometimes. Well, what you've reminded me of is something... Um and I can't think of a name, that um, a well-known author from Queensland who died a couple of years ago of uh, melanoma, she said um, the thing that she noticed most about her um, experience of dying was the sense of loneliness, and that loneliness was because people just didn't want to talk about right. or couldn't talk about the things she needed to talk about. Yes. Um, and it takes a lot of strength and courage, actually, for family and friends to just be there mm -hmm. and uh, allow that person to share um, their depths of despair or yeah. their fears or whatever it is. Yeah, and I think what you said earlier, I think, is true too, Michael. It it, it is an act of courage, but when we and and, and we might be sitting in our own discomfort you know, and not know what to say, but there's no right thing to say. But there is just the capacity to be there with them and share that space, right? Well, I always remember, and I keep it in the back of my mind, um, when you don't know what to say, there's probably nothing you need to say. Right, right, yes. And I think that's so true. And um, I, I'm no different to anyone else. I get very uncomfortable with silence. Mm -hmm. um, but the silence is so powerful, um, and we didn't talk about it in some of the previous recordings we've done, but uh, one of the things that I honour and respect when I'm either as a treating doctor but now more as a visitor, if I walk into the room of someone who's sick, and particularly if they're dying, and they're asleep or daydreaming or seem to be somewhere else, I don't say a word. You know, I might come in and sit down um, because something powerful is happening at those times. Mm -hmm. Daydreaming, using um, a next best thing to end of life dreams and visions, really. Mm -hmm. There's something powerful happening. So I suppose what I'm really getting at 
is silent, just because you're silent, it's not a vacuum. Something is happening. Yes. Certainly happening to you, and it's good yes. for you to be aware of what's going on with you, but mm -hmm. something is happening with the other person. Mm -hmm. There may come a time when that silence has gone for a while, and I will say, um, can you tell me what's happened? You know, just a very open question, and they will say, oh, yes, you know, yes. I've been thinking about this, and then they're off on something else. Yes. Um, yeah, so, but well, the other thing. It's, it's like honouring yep. where they are at the right. moment rather well, than I'm trying to fill the space, you know. Well, in all the conversations we had, it always comes back to we need to go on their journey, not take them on our journey, yes. which is what relatives, this is when relatives say, oh, no, everything will be okay. Yeah, sure, that's the journey you want to take because you're more comfortable with that. Yes. I want to talk about a much tougher journey, journey. you know, the so-called road less travelled. I right. want to get onto that and talk about it. Yes. And, um, you know, it is hard. And so, you know, we talk about advanced care directives. For me, death literacy, community learning um, to, um, uh, it might sound funny, but to be comfortable in being with people. Kayama is a dementia-friendly community, mm -hmm. but we don't have dying-friendly communities. What happens when people are dying? Friends disappear for oh, any I... number of reasons, sometimes very valid reasons, but more often than not, um, not so valid. Yes. And it's like that person said, the loneliness of dying. Yes. Just to finish off an advanced care directive, certainly completing the advanced care directive, discussing it with family, friends and your doctor um, and making that conversation ongoing and advanced care directive needs to be updated regularly, five, certainly five years or thereabouts. Uh, but the other thing is it's a time to look at the way they're leading them. In other words, is there anything you wished you could change or would like to change. And, you know, and I don't necessarily try and get people to meditate, but um, I get them to look at their life and think about, um, you know, what are the regrets and what can you do about those? And the regret might be I've worked long and hard and I wish I would have finished earlier and those type of things. Um, so I suppose because of who I am, I just encourage them to talk about their life. Mm. I had a wonderful experience and um, I took some time off from my work as a palliative care doctor to train in pastoral care. And I remember one chap I went to see, he was about, like I can't remember exactly, but late 70s or 80s. And he had renal failure and his physician was coming back in later that afternoon to talk to him about dialysis. And he ranted and raged about, I don't want that, you know, waste of money, uh, this, that and the other. And then he got off on a tangent saying, what has this happened to me? My next door neighbour drinks, smokes, you know, belts his children around. And I, you know, it's what he's saying, I've been a much better person than that, but look, I'm the one dying and he's alive. And he just went on and on and on. And somehow or other, I, we got on to, tell me a bit about your life. What, what, is, what in, you know, he was, I didn't stop him from doing mm. that, but once I thought he, yeah, he sort of he ran out of steam, <laughs> I thought, well, now let's talk about you. And I said, tell me about you. What, what interests you and what uh, makes life meaningful for you because for me spiritual care is all about what is meaningful for you so getting on to that and it was amazing what he started talking about and he gave an example he said look i used to live down near the entrance and i used to go out in my tinny but i didn't go out to fish i threw the anchor out because i loved hearing the waves you know lapping against the boat I thought, oh, you know, so and he'd talk more about that. And then he starts saying, but I also love bushwalking. I love looking at what's living under rocks and 
various things like that. And I love my grandchildren. You know, these are all the things he was talking about. He said, you know what? I'm going to take my kids out. And he mentioned Blank Oak National Park where I live. And I'm going to say to my grandkids, what do you think lives under this rock? If I peel this bit of bark, what do you think will be there? Anyway, we just kept talking about this. And I'm not sure how long it passed, but the doctor arrived. And I said, I think I better go. And he said, no, no just stay. And the doctor said, now, what do you think about dialysis? And the guy said, yes, I want it because I want to take my grandchildren and show them all the things I've learned about nature. Wow, wow. And so there's a message there somewhere. Absolutely. I'll, I'll let you discover where it is. Yeah. But it's just being with people. Yes. As one of Greg Yoder, who wrote a book about companioning the dying. He said, our job is to go with them down this difficult, um, this dark night of the soul, but not feeling we have to find the way out for them. Yes. They will find their own way out. But they'll only find that way out if we keep encouraging the conversation that allows them to feel the depth of their despair. Mm. But at some stage, it's going to change, and that's, I think, when the healing starts Appearing. Yeah, and it's interesting because I, I love that when we talk about healing at end of life, you know, as people say, well, I'm not going to heal, you know, <laughs> I'm dying. Well, yeah, but that doesn't mean you can't heal, you know, but it's not all about the physical, but there's so many other layers to that. Yeah. And I know for me, you know, you mentioned meditation and, you know, for me, I it's something that's a great interest to me and I've spent many years studying different Eastern traditions and um and and that and there was one woman I worked with um I spent the last three weeks of her life um in the Gold Coast one of the big hospitals on the Gold Coast and she was in palliative care there and uh for the last three weeks and um and I basically moved in there and lived there with her for that time and um she uh, studied meditation as well and with a teacher and um, so we were doing a lot of, you know, learning about the Eastern. And in this Gold Coast hospital, every single member of that palliative care team, including the, the senior physician, they'd all read the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. And I just thought that was like totally remarkable. So they were, her room became like the hangout space yes. because there were always these great conversations going on and explorations, you know, and, and about meditation and about you know, the East and, and how, you know, different traditions look at end of life. And we talked about Tibetan Buddhism. They say that your spirits are around for 49 days and other traditions say it's three days and all of these different things. I mean, we don't know the answer ultimately and we we have beliefs, but I can't prove any, you know, anything. Uh, but I, I I have beliefs about, you know, what feels right to me. But meditation is something that for me I use both as a doula but also just as a as a person, right? You know, for me it's it's a helpful self-support tool. Um, but it's also about, you know, to me, um just opening the heart, you know, yeah. for me, um, and and training my mind. And that's why we were talking in one of our previous talks about, and you had in your the midwife and death course you used to run. I remember the four questions you asked, and we and I I was surprised at these because I'd done all my advanced care planning. I had everything ticked off and all my box done with my death box, as I call it, ready. And and um and I've got three death plans. One is if I die overseas, because often I I travel, you know, post COVID now. I'm going to try again. Um, but also if I have a sudden death versus having a long term illness because they're three separate things. And um, anyway, one of the questions in that you asked uh, us to consider um, was what are our hopes and fears around our own death and where we would like to die and um, what what's negotiable for us and what's non-negotiable? What would we trade off? And so these questions really sat me back. I, I was surprised at what came out of these questions for me about my death. And and I was and I the first thing that came out of my mouth and I had no idea that I thought it was, oh I hope I don't die suddenly, and then I'm like I do, 
<laughs> oh, why do I think that, right? And it was like there was a bit of, you know, what they call FOMO, fear, a bit of fear of missing out. Maybe yeah. there'd be something I hadn't done or some conversation I hadn't had. or And, of course, I had my 16 plastic tubs of stuff <laughs> that I had to get rid of. <laughs> they are gone now, just to say. Um, but but it really stopped me think, to st made me stop and think about, you know, what are my hopes and fears? And these are questions I now use with clients as well for them to think about and talk about um, as well. And one of the things that came out of it was around the what's negotiable and what's not for me is for me, my death and my plan is I, I really want to have, if you like, as an awake death as I can have, right? And it's partly why I'm excited about the research. Mm -hmm. And... And, you know, for me, there are in meditations in the Buddhist tradition, there are actually you can practice to die, you yep. know, um, in, in your meditations, because they say that then as you begin your death process in reality, it's about reverting to your practice. Right? And so part of what I've got that's I don't care actually where I die, I put that in, I don't mind if I, you know, because what I see is a lot of people aren't, but the, the closer they get to death, they're, they're less concerned with their geography right so I was like oh, actually I'll trade that off don't mind about that but what's not negotiable for me is that someone is there making sure that I'm doing my practices and that I'm listening to the meditation and I've said I don't want many people around and I want silence and you know so they're things that are important to me um, and and I'm really grateful for those questions and I wanted if you wanted to share anything you know about your process around that or meditation or just anything you'd like to share around that. Well, I think we find uh, the beauty of having a conversation it brings clarity to thoughts that are there but haven't quite uh, become distilled but the the meditation I do um, asks you to be aware of three things, and that is your breathing, mm -hmm. um, stillness, and awareness mm. of everything. And that's what dying is about. Right, right. Be aware of your breathing. You know, um, yes. in fact, one many meditations, breathing becomes an important aspect. Um, stillness, and that stillness is either enforced because we're so ill. But it's also a practice, and if you're doing it regularly, daily, then it's so much easier to do it when you die. Yes. And um, awareness, just being totally aware of what's going on in me mm. and what's going on in the outside world. And that's more of a witnessing rather than yes. anything else. And, uh, I mean, again, a bit of self-divulging, but this now is what I use when I can't sleep at night. Right. Same. You know, my breathing, I've got a breathing practice that I use that's almost guaranteed to put me to sleep. And if it doesn't, I know I've got to get up and make a cup of tea and read a book for a while. Then right. Go. right. So, to go, yeah. But the, the awareness of your breathing, the stillness, and um, awareness of what's happening um, around you and within you just stills is a sense of stillness, and that's what you want. Mm. At certain times, and certainly as we get closer to death, that's what. So, in a way, meditation is not only a valuable tool for life, but it can, becomes extremely valuable in the time. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, I I share stories not too much, but certainly when I when I'm caring for people who are dying and have got spiritual or religious beliefs, all cultural. I want to know about it, yeah, for not sure. for my own information, but what I need to do to ensure yes. what is meaningful then for them is in fact done. And, yes. um, and we learn on the hop, but there's so many times I've been, you know, sort of blown apart, blown away by the type of things that happen. And the one I particularly remember is, and I might have shared this on because I nearly always do about the woman who wanted to die in the lotus position. Oh, no, I, I don't know that one. Well, because yes, she was she was actually a GP. Yes. Um, but she was also a yoga teacher, and her her two wishes were not to become confused and to die in the lotus position. 
And I, I perhaps will tell the story only to emphasise something we've yeah, not spoken about. Um, so this woman wanted to die in the lotus position, but most importantly, she wanted to retain clarity because of her practices, her meditation practice and whatever. And being a doctor, she knew that morphine could uh, certainly have some effect on the clarity and she wanted to maintain clarity. Death. So she she was the one who titrated the doses, not me. And it was all to do as best she could to control the pain without getting drowsy or confused. She was dying at home and when I, I used to see her most days and one day the family met me at the door and said, oh, look, we're really upset because she's now delirious and that's the last thing she wanted. She wanted to be as clear as anything. Um, at the time of her dying, and she was very close to death. And I said, why, what led you to believe uh, that she's delirious? And they told me what she was saying. And her words were, and I hope I can remember most of them, um, I'm on a tough journey. I have to climb this tall mountain. And when I get to the top, I have to do an appendix, an appendix operation, and I've never done one before. Wow. And I turned to the family and I said, what do you think she's telling me? What do you think those words mean? And they looked at each other, and then they realised what it was. Dying was so important for her, and... My belief is that her memory is this is the first time she's done it, but her belief is, um, goes on to rebirth. But So they understood how important it was for her to die well. Mm. And in a way, she was asking them to help her. Yes, her. yes. And so we, they talked to her, they spoke to her, they, and they assured her they would do everything possible to keep her clear of mind and that she would die in a lotus position. And her mind did clear. And the point I want to make with this story is how people often will resort to metaphors to be able to get their point across. Yes. Um, they can't describe often what it is that they need to talk about other than through met metaphor. Mm -hmm. And that metaphor is such a beautiful one about Dying is not easy business. It's hard work and you can get taken off course, but she's got to get to the top. Yes. But she has to do something. And she's obviously not sure what it is to. Yes. To be sure she dies well, in her case, dying well. Um, and what we decided was to keep her comfortable without going overboard with that. Well, she wouldn't let us with the medication. And to say, yes, we can be sure as best we can that you die in the lotus position. Mm. At a long story short, she died in the lotus position and stayed there until rigor mortis was setting in. And then yeah. we just, yeah. yeah. So imagine what the grief would have been like for that family if they thought she was dying in a state of delirium. But uh, yes. Compared to how they understood the message that she was communicating mm. and assisted in fulfilling her two most earnest wishes to be clear, to have yes. clarity of mind yes. and to be in the lotus, lotus position. position. Yeah. yeah. Oh. So, so to find out what's meaningful in people's lives can right. be. A hundred percent. And there's no right formula. It's about each individual and what if, if they have beliefs or practices or no beliefs i mean that's just as valid you know um sometimes spirituality can be the garden and the dog yeah, you know it's, it's their <laughs> entitlement to die their own death yeah we're not there to have them die our death yes exactly sometimes yes. they're not sure what they want and to have these conversations like my man who did want to die but no he's he felt he had more to contribute yeah and he never thought about this yeah well, and I think that's it, to be able to have those conversations and, and, again, give up an agenda, but just be able to be there and be in those conversations, I think it's just it's critical, yeah. I just, um, I'm not sure we must be getting close, but 
one of the things that uh, sayings that troubles me in palliative care, people die the way they live. It's like, you know, oh, there's no chance for him, you know, etc. Yes. I change that around and say that people start their dying journey the way they have lived, right. but they can change. Yes. And if you create the space and communicate with them, make connections with them, and that may take a lot of time and may not, that connection may not occur, but I think if you're there with the right intentions mm -hmm. and listen, you will create that change. And yeah. so people will change, but yeah. you know, if we label them, they won't change. Well, that's right. We're, we're creating that reality too for them. Yeah. And it's true because I've actually said that myself. And it's like, and when I say I'm like, yeah, you know, that's sort of putting someone in a box, you know, yeah. um, and, and, and I, I get why people say it, um, but at the same time, it leaves no hope. And, you know, as my teacher says, you know, wherever there's breath, there's hope. And so I say, well, that's a good thing. I say that's where the journey starts. Right. You know, they might be a bastard, right? Once they get their diagnosis, that's how they'll react. Yep. Okay. And and this is not a sales pitch, and it can't be because they haven't got any left. But the, <laughs> final, the final chapter in my book on caring for the dying is the story of one such person right. who was a real bastard, you know, at home when he came into the hospice and how that all changed. Right. Um, in case I don't get a chance, there's one book. If I had to pick out the book that's been most meaningful. Please, me, I'd love to hear. And it touches on my interest in that kind of side, kind of um, side of dying. It's a book by Kathleen Dowling Singh called The Grace in Dying. The Grace and in she, Dying? The Grace in Dying. She has since died and yeah. a couple of years ago. She was a Buddhist practitioner. And for me, it's the most wonderful book and should be read by anyone. Oh, great. I'll absolutely put it out there. Yeah. yeah you, I'm not sure how easy it is to get. Um, and I've heard the reason I mention it to you and mention it to many others who are as immersed in this work as you and I mm. uh, is because no one else talks about it. You know, there's some wonderful books, Atul Gawande, yes. Frank Ossieski, um, and many others. Joan Halifax, uh, one of my favorites. Joan Halifax, yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, she works with Frank Ostaseski. That's I right, think. yes. Um, but so I haven't heard anyone talk about Kathleen Down soon. Okay, so, great. Well, we will um, start. We I'm will just start. putting a plug in. Great, Read, thank you. Do what you think. Yeah, absolutely. I will. I'll, I'll absolutely get it. I think there's so much, there's so many great books out there. But I'm always, you know, really interested to hear what, what are people's favourites. Well, Michael, I think our time together, and I'm, I'm going to have to think about something else for us to talk about another day. Um, but look, honestly, my deep appreciation. Say we that can talk, We can talk about my bonsai. Sort of oh, like wow, that. you do bonsai. I've always loved bonsai. Oh, my goodness. I'll have to no, do a no, tour no, of your garden on camera. I just want to uh, perhaps illustrate there is another side to me that yes. gave us yes you know, outer world, so. and 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 veggies i think you like veggies and yes. grandchildren i know you love your grandies yes. yeah look anyway, thank, thank you, you again you. thank you for your time michael and your expertise and all the love you've given in the world um to all of those people that have, you've made a difference to and, and just you're a great human being thank you thank so you. much and um, we'll be in touch and uh, I'll be sharing some links with everybody uh, from Michael's work and uh, we'll look forward to hearing more in the future. Thank you again, Michael. Thanks, Thanks.